Go on and get a book. Turn number 129. Number 129. Seventy six. Number seventy six. Next song be number one hundred number number sixty nine. Number sixty nine. Good evening, brethren. Good to see all of y'all. I still wish the elders would have one of those levers installed where we could just push that thing in the front fuse would just roll down and the back ones would come with them. But it's good to see some of y'all back there. Glad you're here. And um I'm Ron Gilbert, of course, speaking for the congregation. We welcome each of you to our worship service and especially welcome our visitors if we have any and ask that you fill out a visitor's card and just leave it on the pew when you leave. We'd like to have a record of your visiting. Uh, others serving in our worship, Marion Grinder is directing our singing. The opening prayer will be led by David Francis and Jim Holman will have our closing prayer. I'll be speaking at the proper time. Next week, the elders will have an elders meeting at 5 o'clock. The following week, we'll be hosting the Bible Bowl, and that's at 2 o'clock. And that's over the first three chapters of John, the 
got John 2 and 3 for the middle ones, and then for the small ones, it'll be just John 3. Also, the CYC fees are due, but uh, of course, Corey's not here tonight, so you get to keep that a, another week, I guess, or till Wednesday. But that's due. It's thirty dollars a piece you know, while we get the uh, prepayment. It goes up uh, significantly if we don't get it in. So try to get that in. Also, uh, remember our sick. Uh, David and Wanda are just not feeling well at all, and uh, got a pretty good little bug going on. So remember them. Also remember Harold and Jewel, who are not able to be with us. We'll now have the opening prayer. We pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, hallowed be your great name. Father, what a joy it is to come before your great throne and express our wants and needs and, and many, many hurts that we have to you. Father, as we try to program our lives and think about the needs in this dying world, we ask you to help us to think properly. Help us to not celebrate when uh, our enemies have problems and uh, help us that we might let you be the judge of all people and we can be humble in your sight. Father, and help us to go through our lives and try to be a good influence and try to make good decisions in our words and deeds. Also, Father, as we worship this evening, we thank you for everyone here. We ask you to be with the, the sick that could not be with us and the ones that are hurting for other reasons, spiritually and physically. We know that many older people in our brotherhood are, are having many ailments. Father, we ask you to look into their lives. Also, Father, we thank you so much for the many efforts we have in the mission field. People are dedicating their lives with their, their children and their wives are having so much sacrifice with them. We ask you to bless the effort. For everyone, the congregations, where they look deep into their conscience as we try to support the, their lives in monetary and spiritually and in prayer. Father, we uh, continue to worship this evening. We ask you to be with Ron as he delivers this great lesson from Revelation, and may we reap a great benefit from the truth from your word. Father, also as we continue our lives, we ask you to forgive our sins and that we might keep us pure, that we might reap that eternal home of the soul. In Christ's name we pray and amen. Number 69. Invitation sound tonight will be number 88. Number 88. Appreciate that, Mary, and thank you, Brother Francis. I always appreciate men that are willing to take an active role in the um, uh, corporate worship, and it's always good. I was thinking about that last song we were singing, Hide Me, O My Savior. That's exactly what a whole bunch of fellows are going to be saying at the end of chapter 9. 
In chapter 8, you remember we saw uh, some things. In fact, let's just go ahead and jump into it. We're in the book of Revelation, chapter 9. And uh, we're opening the seventh seal. And if you remember, the seventh seal had uh, seven trumpets. And again, at the end of this, you'll have six. usually breaks down four, two, and one. You'll have uh, four, was in chapter 8, four, uh, four trumpets were sounded. Two trumpets will be sounded here, and then the last trumpet will be just like the seals were, which were an introduction to the trumpets. The last trumpet will be an introduction into the bowls or the vials of God's wrath. So the seventh seal was opened, and when he had opened the seventh seal, we had a little bit of silence. And then the seven angels who stood before God were given the seven trumpets to sound. And you'll remember uh, the, the angel took the uh, incense off the altar, much incense. Remember the idea of the prayers being offered? by the saints and he takes that down and he throws it uh, to the earth and of course that means great judgment God's judgment is going to be upon people on earth now now remember that this is not talking about the saints the saints have been uh, not uh, marked but they have been sealed it's kind of interesting it seems the devil uh, marks his people and the Lord seals his people and so we're going to see in verse 5, the angel filled it and threw the things, and there were thunders, lightnings, and notice the voices. Usually this is always um, involves judgment. And so that's exactly what happens for here. God is going to judge these folks who've been, uh, depending on which position you take, have been either the Roman Empire or the Jerusalem, uh, the uh, city in Jerusalem, or, uh, you know, there are some who believe this has a spiritual application and deals with every generation of Christians and whatever maladies they may uh, be going through. You remember the first one was a land disaster, verse 6 and 7. A third of the earth, trees and earth burned up. The second was a maritime disaster where the, uh, the sea was turned to blood and fish and so forth. The sea life was destroyed. The uh, third trumpet was the land water disaster. And then the last one was the heavenly body disaster. We also showed how that that language was pretty consistent with what you see in Joel chapter 2 talking about the day of Pentecost. A great event was taking place, and not that the things that we read in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32 happened literally, but it was a, a, a symbolism, just like this whole book is going to be. I, brethren, just to be honest, <laughs> chapter 9, when I was growing up, was one of the most horrific passages, one of the most scary passages for me in all the Bible. Uh, the place where I was going to church back in those days took this very literal and they would say that these were you know this was uh, uh, actual things that were being released from the hell if you will they were evil spirits I can remember you know I was familiar with the New Testament and I knew that demon possession had taken place because I remember that Jesus would run some of those devils out he would cast demons out of people and then about that time, I'm 11, 12 years old, you know, and uh, the movie Exorcist came out. You remember what that was about? And you remember uh, how, uh, you know, so here I was as a young Christian, knowing that I've re I can read in my Bible, and there are real demons possessing folks. And so that just absolutely scared me to death. And then when I read Revelations chapter 9, and people were telling me this is the release of demons out into the world, you can imagine how horrific that is. And I was afraid that one of those would grab hold of me. And that was just because I did not understand the scriptures. And the people who were teaching me uh, did not understand the scriptures. Now, do remember this, that we, we kind of parted ways there in chapter 6 with the four horsemen. When we got to that place, the folks who believe in the premillennial theology, they, are in a, they believe this is after the rapture. And so they think that Christians won't have to go through this. That's why they have a different group of people in chapter 7 to get, that get marked. Remember those are, or get sealed. Remember the 144,000 in the 12 tribes of Israel? That's why they try to say, well, those are going to be literal Jews because all the Christians are gone now. Uh, that's just not accurate uh, in that uh, the sealing there is something that God is doing. And remember the, the, the illustration is those people are on earth. And then there's a great host in heaven. And so it just doesn't fit with the text, but that's what some people believe. And so now we're going to move uh, the angel, or the uh, eagle, as it's translated in chapter 4, verse 7, flying through heaven saying, uh, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
there's, three, there's still three more trumpets that have to sound, and that's what we're going to be looking at in chapter 9. It says, And I saw the fifth angel, he sounds, and a star fell from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Well, what do you immediately think of when you think of the bottomless pit? Do you not think of the abode of Satan? That's exactly what I think of, and I believe that's what this is talking about. Not that down the road somewhere there's going to be an angel that's going to let Satan out of his uh, prison, if you will, and he's going to come out and torment us and, and give us a hard time. I believe the devil is out right now tormenting and having just a ball with people and with society. He's very much at work now. The scriptures even warn us to be sober because our adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, is roaming about seeking whom he may devour. That doesn't sound like a person in prison to me. If somebody wants to give me a warning about, you know, a fellow I need to be looking out for, the last thing I'd be thinking about is he's in prison somewhere. But, and I believe that that's right. I believe that this is talking about Satan, but I believe it's also talking about the influence of Satan. We see this over and over again. You're going to look at it in Revelations chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, the bottomless pit. You're going to cast him into the bottomless pit. I believe it has more to do with influence. Notice chapter 11, verse 7. Uh, the beast ascended out of the bottomless pit. And so there again we have that. Chapter 17, we're going to see the bottomless pit. Yet once more shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Notice verse 2 of this chapter. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the moon were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And so this pit is, I mean, you can just picture that in your mind. The younger you are, I think, and the more free your imagination, the actually the, the more elaborate you can get with that. Where do you stop with that? And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Now, I had no idea what a locust was back in those days, but I can remember being told about the locust plague, you know, and how they were grasshoppers kind of like on steroids, and they'd all freak out when they got together, and they'd actually get bigger, would change their eating habits and things of that nature. And, uh, but you're going to see that these are not real locusts at all. In fact, they're very different locusts. One of the things, brethren, that I would like to bring out here, a couple of guys who have influenced the idea of premillennialism or the thousand-year reign of Christ, they uh, are extreme literalists, and they would just absolutely beat me and you up over things like Revelation chapter 20 and the thousand-year reign. They'd say, you have got to take that literal. As a matter of fact, if you read their works that from the beginning to the end, they are chastising uh, people who don't agree with them because of... Uh, they're uh, saying you don't take it literal. You take the rest of the Bible literal. Why are you not taking this literal? Even though we looked in chapter 1 where Jesus himself says these things that you saw are not seven stars. They're actually seven angels or seven messengers. These lampstands you saw are not really lampstands, but they're churches. So we learned very early that that's exactly right. It is symbology. It is symbols representing things. And so that's what we have to keep in mind. That's why we can't just get so dogmatic and say, well, this has to be talking about this. The reason I brought those two fellows up in particular, Hal Lindsey and John Wolvert, is because these are not real locusts for them. That is so unfair, isn't it? Because they'll sit there and they'll say, you need to be taking this literal. And then when it feels, they feel like it, they just say, well, this isn't literal. As a matter of fact, Hal Lindsey says that these are, and he says he was helped to be seen this by a friend of his he was studying with, and the friend, they read that passion, he said, I've seen those before. And he said, well, what do, you, what do you mean you've seen those before? He says, I was in Vietnam. Those are helicopters. So he says, those are Cobra gunships, you know, Cobra helicopters. Well, you know, brethren, where in the world would you ever get that idea? We're going to see the description of these things in a moment. And there's nothing like that. There's, you know, they're Cobra gunships. Even Wolvert, who's an extreme literalist, would say, well, these are not just normal locusts. They're a special kind of locust. And, and that's why a good brethren who've answered that have said, why in the world? Uh, would they have to be a special kind of locust if you want to be so literal about it? Well, notice they're going to have the same power as scorpions have on the earth. And it was commanded then that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Remember the seal that everybody received in uh, Revelation chapter 6, God keeping his people safe? These people are, th these things we're reading about are not for Christians. They are to punish the people, whether you believe it's the Roman Empire or Jerusalem, they are the ones to punish. They are judging 
men for what they are doing. And notice, and to them it was given that they should not kill them. I thought Brother McGuigan did a great job here because he says he asked Mr. Lindsay, uh, I've seen Cobra gunships too, and they are very adequate at killing people. That's what they're for. They're not to fly around and just scare people. And so, he, you know, here's a, a point I think is well taken. These are not to kill men, but that they should be tormented five months. Now, remember everything they've been going through so far. We've already had four trumpets sound, and here the fifth one, these crazy-looking locusts, as we're going to be described here in a moment, and they're not to kill people. It's going to last for five months now, just like with everything else in Revelation, brethren. Don't get hung up on the five months, because it's probably not talking about five literal months. Five is just an indefinite number, and it means less than a complete, so they're not going to be destroyed. It's not going to last forever. But for a, a short time, uh, they're going to go through torments. And there was the torment of a scorpion when he struck at the man. I've never been struck by a scorpion, but uh, I, I imagine it would be quite painful and deadly in some cases, I understand. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. Imagine they are so uh, tormented with, the, with the, these, these judgments that God has given that uh, they shall desire death, and death shall flee from them. Notice they won't have the comfort of death. Now... When you study with brethren who believe this is talking about the fall of Jerusalem, and there are some very good points uh, made about that particular time, they would say this is taking place in the city of Jerusalem while the, the Roman armies are outside and everybody is inside. And because you have three major factions inside the city of Jerusalem, this is recorded, this is not just speculation, that we're killing each other. Not only did you have the Romans who had surrounded Jerusalem, but you had three factions inside of Jerusalem that were Jews who were buying, you know, vying for power and uh, were actually at war with each other inside the city walls while they had plenty to worry about on the outside of the city walls. Josephus writes about this and uh, the antiquity of the Jews. That's a firsthand account of what's taking place in Jerusalem. And it's got some good stuff in there as far as some things that you could see and say, okay, I can see how that could be talking about it. Other brethren believe this is talking about the fall of the Roman Empire. And they believe that this, this, this locust we see are actually the, the, the tribes that were coming in that would, you know, over a period of time would destroy Rome. But that will be about 300 years. You know, Rome wouldn't fall till uh, about the 4th century. Um, the uh, Brother Hines, who's written a, the Gospel Advocates commentary on the book of Revelation, if you've been looking at that at all, you'll notice he takes the historical method, and the historical method, method teaches that this chapter is talking about most likely candidate would be Muhammad and the Arabians, you know, the Muslims. Uh, so you can see how many things are being focused on here. And I just bring these to light. I just try to mention these. Because when you're studying the book of Revelations, you, you know, you're almost like Simon, I mean, not Simon, but uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, how can I understand this unless some man guide me? And you pull this commentary or that commentary, you're going to find quickly that uh, not too many men have the same idea. And so that's, uh, that's why I'm trying to give you the best so that you can make a decision as you study it and try to uh, come up with the best answer. Uh, Copeland says that the fifth and sixth trumpets signify tools at God's disposal to bring upon wrath of the persecutors. And I believe that's absolutely right. Whichever Jerusalem or Rome or, you know, now or uh, says, though allowed to go only so far, Satan's influence can have the effect of weakening a nation from within. Notice Daniel brings that point out well. God brings down nations. God raises up nations. He allows people to run just as far away from him as they possibly want to. He allows wickedness to, uh, you know, rule the day, if you will. Romans chapter 1, uh, and men will run. It says, therefore, I concur with Summers. Now, Summers is just a, uh, another commentator. And others, that vision uh, of the locust from the bottomless pit symbolizes the hellish rottenness and internal decadence that would weaken, weaken the Roman Empire. Of course, he believes in latter day. Or Jerusalem, if you believe in the earlier day. And I think he makes some good points there. He says, as Christians in John's day were oppressed by what seemed to be an invincible opponent, what John is trying to bring out in the book of Revelations, Copeland would say, is that God is behind this all. He is on our side. He has sealed us. We're going to be fine, uh, you know, physically or spiritually. 
Uh, we're going to be okay. Maybe some of us will have to die, and that's exactly what Jesus told the church, you know, be thou faithful unto death, um, and I'll give thee a crown of life, but you're going to be protected. You have the seal of God. And so uh, we do not have the seal of God on their forehead, notice, would be susceptible to God's wrath. So the idea of the locust, sin can cause much of the nation to survive or to, uh, to suffer. Think about the moral decay that sets in on a nation, and you see how it kind of just destroys itself w from within. Notice number four there. If they wanted the devil and all his fruits, they could have just that. And it seems like people are bent on that, doing as all they can to cause themselves great difficulty. So one of the great lessons in the book of Revelation, I believe, is a Christian's happiness is not dependent upon outside circumstances. It's what happens. Remember what Paul would say. He says, not that I speak in respect of won't for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And as Christians, we, we of all people should understand that. Naked we came from the womb. Naked we shall uh, return to death. I mean, we're uh, not going to take anything with us. So what we have, how we're treated uh, here on this earth has nothing to do. Paul would say a little inconvenience and a great uh, joy that we're going to have in, in heaven. And that's what he, you know, that whole uh, contrast he would draw. 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 7, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Not easy to be had when we're brought up in America and we think that, you know, I've got to have everything that comes down the pipe if I'm going to be a complete person, if you will. Uh, I was uh, noticing just uh, the other day one of the young men coming down the street there was riding on one of those, uh, you know, those little things they got now. It's like a skateboard, but it goes straight. You don't got to walk. Uh, you know, it's like we just all have to have these gadgets and everything's new. And I know that's uh, by the whole idea behind a free economy, but uh, as a Christian, we need to realize that's not what makes us who we are. We brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we will not carry anything out. Notice verse 7. The shapes of the locusts were likened to horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were the faces of men. Well, now, brethren, I don't think for a moment that those were literal horses, do you? Men, with, you know, we're not scimitars. Uh, you know, the idea of the, the, the uh, mytho mythological character, um, this is describing uh, something just horrific. This is made to leave an impression on you. And I can remember from a ch young man, a young child, that it did just that. This was very scary to me. And their hair was as the hair of women, which, you know, you think soft and pretty. And, 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 but notice their teeth. They're teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. A lot of people, especially in the, that believe in the early day, talk about the horses that would run through Jerusalem as they were attacking each other and things of that nature. Whatever it is, the horse was a, a symbol of power then, just as it is today. But uh, nothing like, you know, more today we probably think of tanks and things of that nature. Calvary was a very influential implement of war. Men were afraid. Horses were large animals. And here you have these horses that are not only just big horses. They're locusts that look like horses. That's amazing. But they have faces like men, hair like women, teeth like lions. I mean, you crank it up a notch. And he goes on to talk a lot about the horses and not so much about the men on them. And that's one of the things Lindsay says, well, they're, they're helicopters. They had tails like unto scorpions and their stings and their tails and their power was to hurt men five months. Uh, the description of the locust is, is terrible. But notice that they're only allowed to hurt men for five months. So their time is limited. Uh, they were shaped like horses prepared for battle, had crowns of gold, faces like men, hair like women, teeth like lions, breastplates of iron, wings. That, so it's an unstoppable force. And that is the idea, just as you're going to see this 200 million man army here in a moment. The people who are wreaking vengeance for God, uh, the armies, the, the representation of God's power are unstoppable, uh, absolutely unstoppable. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abdon and the Greek tongue is Apollyon. Now, once again, I do believe this is talking about Satan. You might say, well, how in the world can God use Satan to, uh, you know, bring forth the best thing. I mean, how can he use Satan as a tool? God has always used Satan as a tool. You know, Satan might have thought he was playing with God in the book of Job, but it was actually God who was in control. It was actually God who was behind uh, keeping the devil from doing whatever he would with Job. He set the limitations, and God allows the devil 
to torment men. He allows the devil to tempt men. He didn't cut off the snake's head in the garden. He allowed the snake, Satan, to have the conversation with Eve. Just as today, God doesn't strike people dead who want to teach something that's evil, who that's something that's bad. Uh, God allows that to take place. He allows Satan to have so much rope. Our job is to not take that rope. Our job is to fight against those forces. And brethren, uh, you know, it's a tough job. It's a tough job, but one that we're commanded to do. Notice Abaddon means destruction. Apollyon means destroyer. So the same word, basically. And again, it says it's not necessarily Satan, but it is probably an angel so named. Uh, I, I believe it's talking about the devil. This is a quote from Riggs. Revelations 9, 12. One woe was passed, and behold, two more. Two more? Five months of these crazy-looking uh, locusts that are like horses that just have this power. You can't stop them. You can't kill them. Uh, yes, exactly. That was the six angels going to sound now. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Notice this is still prayers being answered, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river of Euphrates. Remember what they were doing? They were holding everything back. And so now they're going to let it go. And for the most part, this is interesting. Now, brethren, if you're familiar with the... Uh, the premillennial doctrine, you know, the, Europe plays a big part. Russia plays a big part. They're the bear, they think. And uh, the EC, the 10, we're going to be the 10 horns at one time. Uh, so they're constantly looking for these symbols to be answered. And it's all supposed to take you know, place in all these other countries. But where is this at? <laughs> this is Euphrates. This is right there. And uh, both Wolvert and, and uh, uh, Lindsay don't have much to say about that. They have to put the, the scenario back in the Orient, which is uh, not where they have taken it to this point. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and for a day and for a month and for a year for to slay a third part of men. So for a while, this has been being prepared. God's judgment is something that's been thought out. It's something that's going to work, going to, going to be done. But let me throw one other thing in there. You know, I, I give Lindsay and of uh, uh, most of my attention because I think they best represent that theology we're talking about, premillennialism, where Jesus is still going to come back here and set up a kingdom. But there's another school, a fellow by the name of Ironside, who's very influential. Because, see, all your premillennialists, just like all your denominations, do not agree on these things. Ironside believes that the key to the bottomless pit uh, is doctrine. And he believes that the angel of the bottomless pit, yes, and he says this in his writings, is the Pope. And he believes that, along with uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that this is warning about the Catholic Church, so forth, and the great apostasy and everything. Kind of goes hand in hand with some of the historical stuff that our brethren have taught for probably 100 years. Uh, it's not so popular in the last 50, but very interesting to take a look at. Well, the four angels are loosed. Uh, they're going to kill a third of mankind. Now, remember, the lo locusts uh, were not to kill anybody, but now these are going to kill. There's going to be an outside force. This appears to be an external judgment. I would totally agree. In verse 16, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. Now, if you add that up and write all the zeros, you're going to get 200 million. And I heard the number of them. Uh, this is not to be taken literally. The idea is a force significant enough to carry out God's plan. Remember the, the reason for the book, be written. The churches are going through, Christians are going through a great trial here. They're being shown, chapter 6, as being marked, uh, being sealed, excuse me, chapter 7, being sealed. And the, this, chapter 8 and chapter 9, are what God is doing to the people who are oppressing them. So you have these crazy-looking horse locust things that are going to be coming forth. You can't stop. And now you've got this innumerable army that are going to be coming in. God, his plan will not be stopped. Notice we have the Roman emperors dealing themselves to be deity and can, cannot control the internal nor the external affairs of Rome. And uh, the, the idea there, if you believe that it's talking about the Roman Empire, the Roman emperors, uh, they couldn't even keep the civil wars down and things. Uh, they're not going to be able to do anything about this. Uh, moving on, it says, verses 17 through 19, I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and a jacinth, brimstone, heads of the horses with the heads of lions, out of the mouths issued fire, smoke, and brimstone. Well, brother, uh, Mr. Lindsay doesn't uh, stay away from his nuclear weapons too much, too much, because here he says these are nuclear weapons, the fallout of such. It says, by these, by these three was a third part of man killed. What three? Fire, 
smoke, brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. When you see that word brimstone, just think of volcanic lava flying in the air. It says, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, and their tails were like unto serpents, and they had heads with them that do hurt. Pretty scary thing. Pretty scary thing. The picture of a terrible, powerful army to show that they're strong enough to get the job done. And once again, language not to be taken literally. These horses were something else. With their mouths they killed, with their tails they killed. These were killing machines. And notice from the mouth proceeded fire, smoke, and brimstone. And these three plagues killed a third part of men living. Do you think that would have the effect? You would think that would be enough to, that God would get people to see that, hey, look, what we're doing is wrong. We need to stop doing this. We need to quit oppressing the Christians. We need to believe in God, repent. But it doesn't. Notice, and the rest of men which were not killed, these are the folks that are still alive, were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, not idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, mind you of Isaiah, right? Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. In other words, they just kept on keeping on. They didn't allow all the oppression that they were going through to deter them from the evil that they were doing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things when you read about World War II and the uh, Nazi, uh, you know, concentration camps and how they were just killing people left and right, and even though the Americans were, I mean, across the bridge, you know, across the ridge, and, uh, you know, the Allied forces were coming. They were still pumping out those mills. They were still executing people. They were not going to be stopped until somebody physically came in there and stopped them. Here we have these people who are guilty from, of everything under the sun. Read uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. But they're not going to stop. They're not going to stop. It's just not in them to quit the things that they're doing. Notice the men who were not killed, the worldly or evil men. They still would not repent. God wanted these men to be saved. As a matter of fact, these judgments are so that they'd have opportunity. Remember the ten plagues of, of, of Egypt. Those plagues were sent so the Pharaoh would change his mind. But time and time we'd, get, we'd see that Pharaoh, because of pride, would harden his heart. Here the people, be it the Jews, be it the Romans, uh, be it folks today, are dead set on being against God. And it doesn't seem no matter what we do that they will change. Notice it says the whole purpose of this judgment upon the Roman Empire was to bring men to repentance, whether that's what you believe or the Jerusalem. But these people are simply ungodly, and they're not going to stop doing what they're doing. And notice God will react in a strong way. He always had. So this chapter is surmised. We have the fifth angel and the sixth angel have sounded their trumpets. Uh, the key is given to the angels of the bottomless pit. We have all this coming out, and the army of the horsemen and people will not repent. The, what I'd gather from this, brethren, try to keep the flow as we go. You have the, uh, the, the gospel being sent forth. You have uh, all the problems that are going to be following behind it, the different color horses and death and such. In chapter 7, you have God's people being protected, being sealed. Nothing's going to happen to them. Some may die. When I say nothing's going to happen to them, spiritually. That some Christians are going to lose their life. They're going to be in a place where folks are going to say, listen, you've got to obey the emperor. You've got to offer up this sacrifice. They're not going to do it. They're going to go to their deaths standing for the cause of Christ. That should encourage me and you. When our religion, when our faith is being challenged by those who do not believe or, or believe something differently than we do, to stand for that which is right, to stand for the truth of God's word, just as these brethren were. So chapter 7, they're being taken care of. They uh, have the innumerable host in heaven. You have the 144,000 being marked. God is not going to let his people be destroyed. The angels are held back from doing this. Then we have the uh, seventh seal being opened up. The, the judgment of God comes forth, and it, you read it. That is God's judgment upon sinful man. That was one of the things as a young person that just really scared me. Uh, you know, and I think that's what it's meant for. It's made to get our attention. The book of Revelation is meant to get our attention. If that chapter doesn't get your attention, not much will. But if that's how bad it's described as being judgments upon sinful men in this world, imagine what hell must be like. Imagine what that place that none of us wants to go, it's not prepared for us, it's described in terrible things, uh, darkness, it's falling, uh, eternal flame, worm dieth not, ceasing of the screaming, the gnashing of teeth, all of those things associated with great pain, great agony, 
imagine having to spend eternity in there. Oh, thanks be to God that we don't have to do that because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can have that seal. We can have that protection by becoming one of his. If you're here tonight, you're not a New Testament Christian, why not take that seal? Why not be sealed by the Holy Spirit? Why not obey the gospel and become a part of the solution? Why not take care of the only thing that God has given you power over, and that is your soul's destiny? No man can change your soul's destiny. Only you can. Why not make the choice to become a Christian? Perhaps in times past you have, but you've left your first love. You know, the world can be very beautiful, can be very enticing. The devil knows exactly what he's doing with the influence of the world. Let me invite you to come back home. If we can help you at all, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing. Help to